Although object-oriented programming languages have been around since the 70s, the bulk of computer applications were written by what I'll call traditional languages. These include Fortran, Pascal, C, and Java. I call these traditional languages in the sense that they uh, didn't support the instantiation or creation of objects. As object-oriented languages became more popular and useful, object-oriented features were incorporated into C and Java. In the context of how I've defined a traditional language, simple numeric values were not stored in objects but directly in memory. We call these numeric data types primitives. These existed in these traditional languages such as C and Java in their early years. This video will explain the differences between storing data in objects and storing data in primitives. It's not designed as an in-depth treatment on the topic, but merely a broad overview, so that you can see the differences, advantages, and disadvantages of object-oriented design. In studying object-oriented programming, we're fortunate to use Python because its design is purely object-oriented. As mentioned, over Java's evolution, it added the ability to construct objects for all common data types. So with Java, we'll see both the traditional method of storing data using primitives and the object-oriented method. First, we'll look at what is a primitive, and we're going to look at this traditional statement in Java. It starts with a declaration about what type of um, primitive we're actually going to store. And here we're going to store an integer. And we're going to reference it to the name width. So what happens in a primitive is that I have a name which directly points to memory locations. And so these are bytes in memory. And in these locations in memory, I'm going to directly store the number 20. Now I can use multiple bytes, so this is not just one byte, uh, but multiple bytes allow me to store very large integer values. Now let's contrast that against how we stored integers in Python. So here's traditional approach in Python. And we could create an integer in two different ways, width equals 5 or width equals int 5. So let's look at this construct here, because the compiler does the same thing. Here, although we're using the same word as up here, this is what's called a constructor. And it creates an object. So when we do either of these statements, what happens is we have a much more complicated structure which gets set up in memory. So we're actually creating an object structure which takes up much more memory locations uh, than in the primitive. It has a type here, it's an integer, and it has a value. Here the value is 5. And width is a name which points to the object. Now it seems like the same, but it's, it can be quite different and we'll, we'll describe why that is later. Now in Java, we have, um, we have some choices to make because Java is now uh, supports object-oriented constructs. So we can create an integer as a primitive but we could also use a statement like this. And what we have here is a keyword which is a constructor. And one of the nice things in Java is how you can notice it is that this starts with a uh, capital letter, these constructors. So you can often differentiate between a primitive, with the lowercase i here, and the capital letters here which are constructors which create objects. 
So here we're doing the same thing as, as Python. We're creating an object. The name width is going to point to the object and the integer object is going to have the value too. So in Java we get both the ability to create primitives and the ability to create objects. Why would we use primitives over objects or objects over primitives? Well, let's go back to Python and we learned that all our classes or objects have methods. And these methods allow us easy ways to do things which used to take uh, maybe tens if not hundreds of lines of program. We'll give you some examples. Here we've uh, taken our traditional Python statements and we've corrected, uh, created a list, a list object. And what we can do if we look at the class definition for a list in Python, it supports all kinds of methods or functions. And one of the methods is sort. So simply by using a list method, we can sort a list without having to write uh, a lot of code to do that. Now, in Java, we have the ability to do the same thing. Here we have a constructor and we're creating an integer object. There's a number of ways we can do it, but this is a traditional way uh, of creating a, an integer object. This being the constructor. It's going to have a value 6. And what's nice now is that because x is an object, we can use methods which are associated with the integer class in Java. And one of the methods is toString, which means I could take the number 6 and I can convert that easily to a string character which represents uh, a 6. And we can only do that because we're using objects. Whoops. If we looked at creating x as a primitive, so here we have a declaration statement which is saying create uh, x is a, uh, an integer primitive that's storing the number 6. I can't do this. Since x is a primitive, here when I execute this statement, I'm going to get an error in Java because it's going to say you can't use this method on a primitive. So the advantage of using objects is that there are many methods that you can use which can make your programming uh, life much easier. If you study programming uh, later, you'll find that there's often much debate on should I use a primitive, should I use an object, uh, to store data uh, in various computer languages such as Java. So what I've done here is I've looked at one, uh, some of the common views in why to use primitives in Java. This is an interesting one uh, because it builds on something that we uh, learned before. So we'll talk a bit about, uh, about this uh, uh, this problem here. What we've done here is we've created two objects. We've created an object 2 and A is pointing to that object. And we've created an object B. Has the same value but there are two different objects. Now what we learned in Python, if you can remember, was that Python always creates objects and by default if we're using any quality, checking to see if things are equal, Python only made things equal if they pointed to the same object. So by default, if we did this in Python, normally this would return false because they're not the same object. We would have to have both A and B pointing to the same object. 
but we don't. However, this is not how Python works because what Python does is it takes that default and it overloads it. You remember we overloaded the EQ in some, um, some of our user-defined class definitions to make sure that if they had the same value, they returned the true and false as we expected. But in Java, here, if we create an integer a and an integer b, two different objects, and we do this test here that we see, we're actually going to uh, we're actually going to get false because by default, this type of test will only return true if the two objects are the, are point to the same uh, object. A and B point to the same object. So how can we get around that? We can get around that by doing a test uh, like this. A dot, and because A is a object, we can use a method called equals. And we've got to remember that. So if we don't remember that and use this, we're uh, going to get some unusual results. It's going to be hard to debug. So one of the recommendations is to use primitives for things like integers and floats because they're just easier. We avoid these types of mistakes. Readability may be better if we use primitives. So here is the example of using primitives for integers and then saying if c is not equal to d, we execute a block. Here, if we're using objects, what we have to do is we have to use the method, not a equals b, and what they're saying is that this code is harder to read and understand what's going on than this is. So readability is better if we use primitives, and if readability is better, uh, it's going to be easier to maintain and easier to debug. Formants. Objects are a much larger um, construct in memory. They take up many more memory locations and they're slower to process. The um, CPU is doing much more reference, much more work in referencing the object, returning values, and accessing methods. So using objects when you could use a primitive, you'll find that uh, the primitives will give you better performance. And finally, today, most people use primitives in Java, so it's the standard. So why would you write code that is not um, sort of the standard that's used out there because other people will uh, not understand uh, how you're using uh, the objects as well? So that is just um, some people's view on the use of primitives uh, in Java. I have uh, come to look at uh, sort of a hybrid type of opinion that sometimes primitives are better to use and sometimes objects are better to use. So if I'm storing an integer or a float or a single letter, it's called a char for character in Java. It's often easier to use a primitive. But if I'm storing a series of, um, of letters or numbers as, as characters, it's much better to use the string object because there are many more things I can do if I use a string object in Java. I can sort it, I can capitalize it, and so on. So as the data types becomes more complex as strings and lists or dictionaries, it's much easier to use objects because you get to use the methods with these objects, which can save you huge amounts of, of programming time. So that's a quick overview of primitives, objects. You'll see both types in Java. Remember that Java tends to use constructors which have capital letters as opposed to the primitives which have declarations. So when you see something like this with a capital, that's called a constructor and it's constructing an object. Something like this is a declaration, part of a declaration statement where it's saying we're going to create a primitive integer. Hopefully this, uh, as you go forward, 
you can build on this and this will make this concept of data types in Java seem a little easier.